Hello, everyone. Today with us, we have Doug Nordman, who is the author of The Military Guide to Financial Independence and Retirement. He is also the author of the book Raising Your Money Savvy Family for Next Generation Financial Independence, which he co-wrote with his daughter. And not only that, he personally achieved financial independence in 1999, where he and his wife have been living off the 4% safe withdrawal rate since then. Doug, how are you doing today? Oh, doing great, Deacon. Hey, it's glad to see you. It's great to see you back behind the microphone again. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, I hear I have a, a face for uh, for radio, so I don't know what that means, but... <laughs> you are um, not alone. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to have you on the show today. So what made you decide to pursue financial independence? Uh, this might seem like a very old, and very familiar story from the last millennium, but uh, at the time that we started our family, my spouse and I were both on Navy active duty, and we had both about 10 years of service, and we at the time were just going to continue on until 20. Maybe one of us was going to become the chief of naval operations or chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, those kinds of aspirations. And then we started our family, and I wanted to spend more time watching our daughter grow up. Uh, and that was largely incompatible with the uh, duty station I had at the time and the responsibilities I had at the time. And that led to some significant uh, conflicts and uh, definitely a lack of work-life balance. And so uh, we started casting about. And at that point, we were thinking about just leaving active duty entirely and saving up money for a transition fund. The theory back then in the military was that if you leave the military, you need to face six to 12 months of unemployment and have money to tide you over until you can get a job. Maybe maybe you'll be lucky enough to be a greeter at Walmart. Of course, that was back in the 1990s. Today, we know it's not that way anymore. And when we were saving up that transition fund, we started learning everything we could about what turned out to be, this is 1992, 1993, financial independence. And right around that time, the book, Your Money or Your Life, showed up in the uh, hot picks section at our local public library and was available for borrowing for one week. And uh, that changed everything. That's the Vicki Robin book? That's the one. Uh, we yeah. read it in the original edition, and uh, suddenly a whole new possibility of life opened up in front of us. And we began planning for financial independence. Now, we we had always been pretty frugal. A lot of that was based on sea duty and the glamorous Navy lifestyle. But uh, when you're deployed to the Western Pacific on a submarine for six months, you learn how to spend pretty much nothing. Uh, but we also had been saving and investing and building our, our assets. And of course, when you read a book like that, you suddenly have a purpose for what has been a habit for the last five, 10 years. And a few years later, uh, The Millionaire Next Door came out also in the hot picks section at our local public library. And we learned even more from that. Those two books were foundational. Those were the absolute bedrock of us deciding to start saving for a goal, not just saving for the next transition or saving for something else. Yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, the, the Millionaire Next Door was definitely an eye opener for me to realize that the average millionaire had like a $300,000 house and <laughs> drove like a $20,000 car. And you're like, wait, they don't have the mansion. They don't have the Bentley, you know, like the average millionaire. Right? No, they just spent way less than they make. And they they knew the value of a dollar. And right? it sounds like you and your wife kind of, you, you had that same experience. So, but from 93 to 99, how did your life change now that you had this new vision and, and kind of where, where did you guys go from there? We 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 were more focused. Uh, for example, we had been investing in mutual funds in the 1980s, and we'd been chasing actively managed mutual funds, the next hot manager. Uh, we were paying expense ratios of, you know, one, one and a half percent. That was normal, uh, as were sales charges. Fidelity would actually charge you 2% to invest in one of their more popular funds. If you wanted that that big winner from Peter Lynch, Remember Fidelity Magellan? That was that was three percent. And wow. once we start reading about that, we realized, hey, we might be paying a little too much in uh, in fund expenses. And so we started looking more into passively managed index funds. We we got much better at this after I retired from active duty in the early two thousands. But we also started investing with deliberate intent. It wasn't just oh, I'm going to save for a transition fund. Oh, instead we were looking at getting to as far as we could get in our careers and and saving up we knew now that we were going to need to save you know roughly a million dollars uh, we really had no idea at the time um 
as, as you know, Bill Bengen published his SafeMax study in 1994. Uh, that was something that only financial nerds who had a subscription to an expensive magazine really paid attention to. But we still had Morningstar. We still had other publications that talked about financial independence. And then 1998, when the Trinity study came out, everybody's eyes were open to the actual math behind the numbers and the sustainability and all the inherent risks that one has to be aware of and, and counteract. That's when we really, in 1998, really realized that we're probably there. And in 1999, because it was the height of the internet bull market, uh, we reached financial independence there, along with, I like to say that everybody reached financial independence in 1999 for about 15 minutes. And we were part of that crowd. But by then, our careers had uh, had, had evolved. Uh, it was clear that I was not going to continue on sea duty in the submarine force and make all kinds of senior rank. And that I was going to retire at 20 years in 2002. And at the time, I was at a, a duty station where life did not suck. It was a, a submarine training command where I had much more control over my time and our life work life balance. And so I stayed until my retirement in 2002 from active duty, which means my pension started right away. Uh, my spouse had stayed on active duty almost as long. She uh, left for the reserves a little bit before I retired. So essentially, by 2002, we had my pension coming in. We had our investment income, but neither one of us was working full time. And how old how old were you at that time? Uh, I retired in June 2002. I was 41 years old, and our daughter was nine and a half years old, entering what today we call the danger years. So I was glad to be at home. Yeah, that's incredible. 41 years yeah. old. I think yeah. people watching this, um, you know, I'm 40. I'm going to be 41 in just a couple of weeks. So depending on when yeah, I watch well. this, uh, I'm going to be right where you're at as far as age wise. Uh, but they're thinking, man, to retire that early. I mean, most people yeah. think 65, 67 later, you know, um, yep. what what kind of things are going through your mind when it comes to the amount of income that you're making and the amount of money that you're saving? I mean, I know the books you've read. Did you have a savings yep. rate in mind? What what kind of was your process for that journey? Well, we we had we have a bunch of stories behind that. Part of it was with both of us on active duty, we were aware of conventional wisdom in the 1980s that if you're a two-income family, it would be a good idea to learn how to live on one income in case one of you is unemployed. And so that was just the conventional wisdom. There used to be a, an author who uh, wrote a big book about that. I think it was Sylvia Porter. And so that was just what you did. Uh, so we had learned to get a savings rate of about 40%. And we kept that up for most of 17 years. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, as I was looking at getting out of the military again for about the fourth time, you know, I, I was perpetually planning my exit and it never worked out. As I was doing that, my father, uh, he had retired in his late 50s, and he was visiting us on Oahu, where we were stationed at the time. And uh, I was telling him about all the uh, transition services that the military affords to you when you're thinking of leaving active duty. And you can take career surveys and interests and assessments and workbooks and interviews and a whole bunch of stuff. And all of it said that I'd make a, a great middle-level manager or maybe a nuclear engineer because uh, that was my background in the submarine force. And frankly, I'd had enough of both of those types of glamorous careers. I was not happy. I was griping about this to my dad. And he gave me this look. You've seen this look from uh, various other fathers in sitcoms over the years. And he gave me this look and he said, you've been in the Navy for quite a while. Have you managed to save any money? And I said, well, actually we have. Yes, quite a bit. And he said, well, why would you want to go out and get a job after you retire from active duty? Why do you want to get a job after Navy if you have enough money? And and again, that was a, a, a big epiphany that I had not really had because like you, I was still trapped in that mindset of, well, I'm going to leave the Navy and get a conventional job and climb the corporate ladder for another 20 years until I'm in my 60s. And by then I'll finally be old enough and maybe even mature and responsible enough to retire and, and to live a retired life. Uh, so the idea that I could do that in in 2002, leaving active duty and getting a military pension, then <laughs> that was like the uh, the clay tablets and wooden styluses and abacus version of saving for financial independence and early retirement. And it worked. The Trinity study showed us how much we would need. And in the late 1990s, uh, 2000, 2001, as, as we we're going through the internet recession, Again, I was doing the math. I was talking to financial advisors. You know, that free hour you get when you're consulting with a financial advisor. 
And I was finding out that, and as you know, uh, being a financial independence blogger, that we tend to take better care of our finances. We tend to have better records, more data, more understanding uh, than the average person who's just trying to get through their life with paycheck to paycheck. And every financial advisor I talked to, their worksheets, their questions, their services, uh, I knew all that stuff. And I wasn't seeing the value that I was getting out of it. One of them actually said to me, he said, wow, uh, you guys seem to be doing pretty good. Why don't you just try to save what you got and maybe only spend about, oh, I don't know, 4%. And again, another epiphany uh, that we probably were at the same level as the financial advisors and ready to handle our own financial independence. And so that's how the thoughts go. At first, you're worried about your employment. You're worried about switching jobs or switching careers and having the financial resilience to do that. Then your family or some other significant life event comes along and you want to spend more time on that than you do on commuting and career. And eventually you get to the point where you realize, hey, I might have enough money to make this work. And here's some literature and some studies and other information that it's sustainable. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Uh, recently, um, Dave Ramsey had made a, a comment. Um, uh, yeah, right, right up the front, Dave yeah, Ramsey. I, okay. I, yeah. I mean, I'm, and you know what? We're just, I think we're two financial, you know, um, I don't say experts, but people in the field. Um, and he had mentioned that you should be able to live off of $80,000 a year on a $1 million. And what we know that to be is an 8% withdrawal rate. And for me and a lot of other financial people were like, <gasps> you know, this gasp of like, well, right. we know the numbers, right? Like it's, it's one of those things, like, I, I think what he used was, well, if you're getting 12% on your money and you're taking 8% out then you have a 4% gap, you're fine. Right. But you have Inflation. these years, you have these years where the market's down. And if you go down, you know, 10% and you're taking out 8%, like that will eat through your, your, you know, your reserves. So tell me about why you guys settled on the 4% rule and kind of your view of, of maybe going higher to 8%. Let me, let me start off with a disclaimer that Dave Ramsey has shown a lot of people how to get out of debt. He's not very polite about it. And his system is pretty harsh pretty authoritative and authoritarian, but uh, he has shown many people how to get out of debt. And that's great. I wish he had stopped right there. There are investments out there that do return 12% per year, pretty reliably. For example, Warren Buffett at Berkshire Hathaway has got a pretty good track record in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Not so good today because when you're a multi-billion company approaching trillion dollar market capitalization, it's kind of hard to keep up that momentum you had when you were just a tiny little $50 million company. But he is aware, Ramsey is aware that there are places out there that earn that much money. The problem is it's not sustainable. Yes, you can withdraw 8% from assets at certain times in history, and it probably got you 30 years. We are not in those times right now. And we may never be in those times again. On the other hand, 4% has been pretty well proven to be the worst case. If you live off a 4% safe withdrawal, right? And by that, I mean, starting with withdrawing 4% of your assets and raising it every year for inflation, all the financial independence bloggers and probably even most of your audience now knows this, that you're just starting with 4% and raising it every year for inflation. That has been shown to be highly successful. And by highly successful, I mean, there are far worse things that are going to happen to us in our lives than having to worry about running out of money. We all know that if you start at that 4% safe withdrawal rate, your success rate is over 90%. We know that you will see any potential failure coming from months, maybe even years away. And again, I speak frequently with people who have way more money than withdrawal rate. They spend you know, 2 3% and they worry. They're millionaires and they worry about, is it safe to quit my job? Will my money last? Will I be okay? And although they are right to be concerned, I can show them the math, I can show them the tactics and the strategies to counter all these issues that they're rightfully concerned about and say, these are just financial worries and you have more than you need to live on a wonderful lifestyle that you're gonna design for the rest of your life. And there are far worse things that will happen to you if you continue to work at a typical career or the typical commute and a typical bad work-life balance. Financial is the least of your worries right now. Take the leap. It's all going to work out. And so we talked through all that. And then there's a whole bunch of math, a whole bunch of logic behind that. And there's, frankly, the emotions of 
behavioral financial psychology that are really driving that fear. And then once you learn to get comfortable with that, once you learn to deal with that and look at it and work with it, and, and you get more accustomed to it, then you begin to be aware that we all started with a scarcity mentality when we started our careers. We were all worried about having a job and earning enough money to feed ourselves and then feed our family. Once you reach financial independence, the next challenge is to develop that attitude, that mindset of abundance. And, and knowing that you have tremendous human capital, you can earn more money if you ever need it, you can find a career that you really enjoy that's challenging and fulfilling, or you can stop working and find other things to do that don't involve a paycheck and just involve an avocation where you don't even feel like you're working in the first place, let alone earning money and enjoying life. So those are the things that are issues as you're approaching financial independence. And those are the things that in 1999, 2002, uh, those tools really weren't out there. They, they'd been published, but we were all still standing around trying to figure out there has to be a horrible mistake. There has to be something wrong. And I think Dave Ramsey is still stuck way, way back in that era where it seemed perfectly obvious to him that the funds are right out there. And frankly, there might be some self-interest there. If you give him some money, he'll connect you with the people who own those funds and can help you invest in it. So uh, I, I spend my time talking with military families about financial independence. And I do that for free because I want them to understand that they have tremendous human capital. They can reach financial independence and they can design their own life. And it's not going to be 8%, but 4% is certainly an abundance mindset. Yeah, I love that. And and kind of along those lines with military or people that are in public service and have pensions, what I'm curious about is it seems like it might be easier to do as a, <laughs> I, I, this is just well think about it like most people don't have an employer that's going to be paying them after 20 years right, right. like you're absolutely right and so i'm curious how does it differ for the military when it comes to like a pension versus non-military people let me let me start with a couple of disclaimers before we start making the military look like a great deal which <laughs> okay. is actually well it can be but sure. first off you're only talking to the survivors you're mm -hmm. not hearing from the survivors of, from the families of people who did not survive their military career. There is no other career in America that I can think of other than the typical first responders like police, firefighter, uh, medical people, where you agree to serve for a specified number of years and you might get killed during the process. So <clears throat> pay attention, survivor bias. Don't look at the military as a great career just because you hear from the people who have gone 20 or even 30 years or longer and who have retired on that pension. Uh, the second fact that very few people know is that only 15% of the people that enter the military actually stick around long enough for that pension. One out of six, 15% wow. get an active duty or a reserve pension. And what that means is there's a 85% of the people who join the military only serve a couple of enlistment contracts, a couple of service obligations, and then get out. And today we actually have a, a compensation plan in the military. It's called blended retirement system. And by blended, we mean it's not just a pension if you stick around for 20 years. Now, if you serve for your military time, you'll get matching to your thrift savings plan, your version of the 401k. And so you don't have to stay for 20 years to invest in a pension and get some guaranteed income. You can do a lot of that in your 401k. You've got a defined contribution plan as well as a defined benefit plan. And so for the 85% of people that joined the military and later on realized it wasn't what they thought or it wasn't quite what they expected, they at least have some matching contributions in their thrift savings plan, a high savings rate outside of the 401k and IRA and retirement accounts, all of that will get you well on the road to financial independence. What you really have learned from the military is you've served a team, a mission, a purpose in your life that's higher than just yourself. You've learned tremendous skills of internal discipline and commitment and perseverance. You've built the capacity for immense human capital. You've learned how to get stuff done in the military. And that stuff translates directly to a civilian career. In fact, now that I'm retired, I'm aware of how big a network is out there of people who are working civilian careers, military veterans. 
and they just wish they could find more military service members, even military spouses to hire and to have them work in a career because these people know how to get stuff done. They know how to work with a team. They know how to overcome surprises and crises and, and work through all the things that you survived in the military experience that translates very well to a civilian career. It's easy to see now that I'm on the outside, but it's very hard to see when you're just starting your military service. So there are advantages to joining the military, but the pension is not necessarily one that is going to attract more than 15%. And there is that survivor bias. You will probably come out of the military with some body and fender damage to your joints uh, just from the things you do. Even you know, we joke about it, even if you're in a submarine force or the Coast Guard, you're still going to come out with some body and fender damage. Sure, sure. No, that, that's really a good point, Doug, especially, um, you know, you, re you look at the money side of things, but you don't necessarily yeah. look at the sacrifice side of things where it's like that people are putting you, you put yourself on the line, people act in the active military and first responders. So, and that's part of the reason yeah. why the pension's there, right? We want, we want to make sure that right. those people are taken care of. Um, and so um, really good points. Now, if someone's listening to this and they say, okay, um, I want to get started with like a financial independence journey right? Where would you say they get started? It's the same whether you're in the military or a civilian in a career, or even if you're a high school student, or if you're in your 50s and 60s, you know, late to discovering financial independence or catching up to financial independence. It's all the same. Step one, track your spending. You can't do anything else without knowing where the money's going. And by track your spending, I mean, just pay attention to where the money goes, you know, write it down on paper, use an app on your phone, use something like Quicken or, well, I can't say Mint anymore, Credit Karma, use some, some tool that works for you that you will reliably use to find out where the money's going. And I'm not saying this is a new year's resolution, like you're going to go work out at the gym for two hours a day and lose 30 pounds by February. All I'm saying is just start paying attention to the data, write it down. So you know where the money is going Three or four months later, after you've been doing that, no judging, go back over your expenses, go back over the spending from that three or four months and figure out where you're wasting money. And this is a highly individual decision for everybody. Uh, some people will say what they're spending and say, oh, I'm doing fine. I'm on track. That's great. Others will look at their wasted spending and say, well, I'm wasting money here, there, and everything. Sometimes it's subscriptions. Sometimes it's... <clears throat> alcohol. Sometimes it's just uh, the idea of running around uh, it with a you only live once attitude and, and you're afraid to miss out on experiences and maybe your travel exceeds your budget to support it. Whatever the waste is, you get to decide, not my problem, not yours to judge, just track the spending and figure out where the waste is. And now you're going to start cutting out the waste. And that sounds simple. Uh, and it, it's straightforward, but it's not as easy as it sounds. The thing that you want to do is turn your behavior into the person who is saving for their future, who is investing for their financial independence, who is building a better life. You might not quit working in your 40s, but you might have enough money by your late 30s to where you can start taking sabbaticals, gap years, mini retirements. Maybe you want to take a few years off to spend time with your young kids when they're growing up. It's your version of what you're going to do with your abundance that you have saved from just cutting out the waste and invested and started growing into the capital that you're going to live off someday. I'm not, I'm not trying to tell anybody to quit their careers or, uh, or, or beat my age for retirement. You know, you're, you're 40 years old, you're come up on 41, you probably aren't going to have any time to change the plan enough to get rich more quickly. But the whole point is to reach your version of financial independence that makes you happy and makes you feel satisfied and feel like you're living a life of abundance. Yeah, that's a great point. One of the things that really is striking me today, though, is the cost of living, right? And yeah, so I'm wondering, because right? uh, for a lot of people, I look at where we live. We live in Scottsdale, Arizona. The The price mm. per square foot is significantly different than if you're in like Cincinnati, Ohio, Right. So has that played a My role? My family for... comes from Cincinnati. That's a little too close to home, but yeah. Oh okay. man, I'm, well, that's they—they they have affordable housing. That's all I can say. I mean, I, I don't know much about the the, the area, but um, what, what I just say, like, what is what role does these different large purchase decisions, whether it's a home, a car, 
Um, you mentioned travel. What role are those playing in, in a financial independence journey? And um, how do you kind of make those decisions or recommend well, been, other people do? We, we've been hearing about the uh, latte factor for years. You know, David Bach mentioned that way back in a 1990s book, something about buying a latte every day. And somehow that became the latte factor. And now everybody's admonished that if you would stop spending $5 a day and put that money in your in your savings account and invest that in a Vanguard total stock market index fund, you would have in 50 years, you might have, you know, $4 billion. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is cutting out the waste in your life and optimizing it for financial independence. Now, the three biggest areas that you can get the biggest return on reducing the waste are the lifestyle expenses of home living arrangements, transportation, and food. And now some people are going to feel like the priority is on their home, their their living area. The others are others are going to feel their priority is on transportation, and still others are going to be more interested in food. Uh, in the in the attitude that you're developing as you look at these things, you can decide whether it's worth renting or buying. And frankly, for many people, most of your life you're going to want to be a renter, not an owner of a home just because the median American career changes locations about every seven years. For whatever reason, people in America tend to move roughly once every seven years. If you buy a home, you might make money during that period. It depends on whether you're fortunate in the timing in which you bought in that house and, and when you sold it. Uh, what is at least as likely is that seven years later, you're just going to get the money out that you put into it. Maybe you're going to get a little extra cash from some appreciation or maybe the sale expenses are going to cost you more. You're actually going to have to pay somebody to take your home away from you at a little bit of money. So all these decisions depend on where you are in life, what you think you're going to be doing with your career and how long you want to keep working. Uh, so if you feel like you want to have a big home in your twenties, well, you're going to be working for it and spending money for that. If that's important to you, that's fine. You might be working a little longer for financial independence than somebody who's uh, living in a, in a small condo or in a townhouse, or maybe living in a, in a house where they're sharing with roommates. Those are all choices. They're your choices, not, not my choices and not something you have to do. And same thing for food and transportation. If you can cut out the waste in those areas, then you will reach financial independence faster because you'll have a higher savings rate. So that's the best way to approach that situation. Uh, as far as where you live, I, you know, I'm not exactly a, a, a paragon of virtue in advising people on how to buy real estate. We live on Oahu, which has some of the highest real estate expenses per square foot in the nation. We actually sell the lots by square foot here because nobody owns acres of land on Oahu unless you're you know, the state or a, a nonprofit. But on the other hand, we've managed to buy a house here on Oahu by buying a place that was in terrible condition with a great floor plan and a good location. And then we did a lot of do-it-yourself home improvement. Uh, we joked about how for many years we were working on turning our home into a house. <laughs> and you do the same thing uh, over and over and over again. There are many bloggers, many people, especially on Bigger Pockets, the, the real estate website, who will talk about uh, moving into a crappy place, fixing it up, and then later on selling it, moving it when you get to that point in your life. So that's one example of, of how to make choices on, in this case, housing. And you make other choices like that with transportation. Uh, for many years, I, uh, I bought crappy cars because I really didn't care. If I was going to go to sea in a submarine for weeks or even months at a time, transportation was not a priority. Uh, at one point in my life, I put more miles on my bicycle commuting to and from Pearl Harbor and home than I did on my car. Uh, now that we're financially independent and we have more time and we can investigate more types of transportation, uh, now we've now we're families owning electric vehicles, and uh, I really enjoy electric vehicles, but on the other hand, we also have a photovoltaic array, a solar array that gives us free electrons to charge the batteries in those electric vehicles. Uh, these are spending decisions I would have loved to have made in my 20s. Now I can afford it. Now I can afford the capital expense to go out and buy that stuff to have that cheap operating cost behind an electric vehicle. And uh, as far as food goes, I, I am not a foodie. I, uh, I spent my year eating submarine food, which is arguably pretty good stuff, but I am just not a foodie. So that's where we save money is on being frugal with our, our budget choices for groceries. 
Yeah, I love that. I think one of the old sayings is that you you make money on the purchase of a home, right? Like the idea. Oh, gosh, yes. Oh, like, yeah. Like you said, you, you bought something that needed to be fixed up. So you're going to get a good deal on that because people don't want to put in yes. the elbow grease, right? The, the two um, times we have hit big on homes, the only two times, okay, maybe three, is uh, when we have found a seller who is in a hurry. Uh, sometimes they are stressed and they just want out. And they're usually dealing with a house that's in a great location, but maybe it's got a great floor plan, but nobody's been taking care of it. It's turned into dirt, uh, crappy maintenance, some repair problems, stuff that we can see right away, knowing we're going to have to spend tens of thousands of dollars fixing things up over the next few years. Uh, but you're right. You make a lowball offer in those situations. You mentally are ready to walk away if the seller has some resistance and wants to negotiate because they're the one who is desperate, not you as the buyer. And that that's when it's worked out well for us. We've we've had other times where we bought where we've been more desperate than the seller, and we've bought because we were desperate, and that didn't work out so well. So I've tested both sides of the theory. Well, it's good. Yeah. So you have firsthand experience. You can guide people in the right direction. Uh, which- exactly. What, what, um, one of the things you had mentioned, uh, we could just tap, tap on just for a little bit is you said you're an amateur landlord. What does that mean? Accidental long distance landlord. The conventional wisdom in the eighties and nineties in the military was to go to every duty station, buy a house there. When you transfer in two or three years to a new duty station, keep using your military housing allowance to buy another house at another duty station and just keep on doing that. And after 20 years, you'll own six or eight or 10 houses and you'll be rich. Uh, and that was because before the World Wide Web was created in the 1990s, we really didn't have any way to invest nationally. Instead, you would look around your zip code pretty much, maybe the town you were in, and figure out where you could buy a property. And after a lot of sweat equity and after probably very little cash flow over the years, eventually the appreciation would work out in a good way in the long term at about the rate of inflation, but at least it kept you from wasting your money on get rich quick schemes and multi-level marketing or penny stocks. That's pretty much how that conventionalism worked out. So again, today we, we tell families that you can buy a house and be a landlord, but go into that with your eyes open. It's not passive. It's not even as easy as it looks. If you are the kind of person who's fascinated with it, you will succeed at it. You'll learn, you'll persevere, you'll overcome the obstacles. If you're just a military family who's living in a town for two or three years before you move to a new duty station, I would rent. I would live on base or I would rent. And I would wait until you are no longer on active duty to decide to buy a home. And even then, we we know today in military families that about half of them, after they leave the military, they move again within the next two years. And the reason isn't because they're you know running out of money and unemployed. The reason is because they got a job as soon as they got out of the military. And within two years, they figured out how to get an even better job. And they're moving to a new location because now they know where they want to live, what lifestyle they want, and they've got the money to afford it. And so maybe you're not even going to buy a home for three or four years after you get out of the military. That's what happens with amateur landlording and accidental landlording and long distance landlording. It's all very challenging. Absolutely. And there, there's three different ways that I've talked about, um, you know, for financial dependence, stock market, uh, real estate, and then owning a business, right? Right. Now, absolutely. Um, these are great ways to have, you know, passive income or somewhat passive income, because sometimes, like you said, it's not passive. Um, so I'm curious what you wrote a book, actually you wrote a couple books, what inspired you to write your first, your first book? Uh, there's a forum. Uh, it's still in existence today called earlyretirement.org. And I was one of the early members way, way, way back in 2002 after I retired. And on that forum, there was another guy. His name is Bob Clyatt. Bob was writing a book that became Work Less, Live More. That was published in 2005 and went to a second edition a little later. And, and Bob was working on that book on the forum. He had sold the pitch to a publisher and now he's writing material and he's asking the forum questions, you know. What happens if everybody in America reaches financial independence? Nobody wants to work anymore. What happens to the economy? Or what happens after all the baby boomers reach age 65 and retire and sell all their stocks and go to 100% bonds and CD portfolios? The stock market's going to implode. Those kind of questions were the, the cutting edge research on financial independence way back in the early 2000s. 
And as he's writing that book, a bunch of us on that forum were looking at the material and saying, you know, we solved a lot of that problem in the military if you can get a pension. And some of that is taken care of with inexpensive health care. Maybe there's a, a military aspect to reaching financial independence that nobody else is writing about. And finally, I volunteered to help assemble all the crowdsourced advice. And I was actually publishing draft chapters on that forum. And people were commenting on it, you know, I want to tell this story, I want to tell that story, oh, you're wrong here, we could sh we could discuss this over there. And that worked out to be the book, The Military Guide to Financial Independence and Retirement. And now it's been 13 years, but it's an evergreen book. The advice is still good. There have been a few changes to some military programs that I will, you know, update that book with. And I talk about all the changes on the blog in the first place. All the material is out there for free, but... People want to own the book. They want to have something that they can look at in case the blogger disappears or in case the, they can't get to the blog anymore or in case they want to highlight the margins and write on it. And, and frankly, some of the people that uh, get the book just get it to say thank you. Uh, and when they're done with it, they end up donating it to their library. And, and this is not just American libraries. This is U.S. military-based libraries all over the globe. You know, I'll get somebody from the Middle East telling me they found my book in a library and they're reading it and they have questions. That's incredible. Yeah, I, th I think one of the things about a book too is kind of like I've always viewed it as somebody taking the knowledge they've learned over a lifetime up to that point, right? And you're paying yeah. 20 bucks for that? Like, that's a really good yeah. deal as far as like, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm in the military. I want to learn how to retire early or, you know, achieve financial independence. Now, what? Well, okay, it's, like, so it's like that Star Wars line, though. It's like, I hope you know what you're doing. Here's $20. But the other issue behind that is that I give all my writing and speaking revenue to military friendly charities. I don't want that junior enlisted person to spend 20 bucks on my book. Uh, it's all in the blog. And if the book's at your library, that's where you should be going in the first place. That's awesome. So, okay. So that's the the first book. The second book though, uh, Raising Money Smart Family for the Next Generation of Financial Independence. What, what, how did that come about? It turns out that the term money smart children is copyrighted, uh, trademarked, excuse me, trademarked. So uh, <laughs> in fact, you, you and I know them both from FinCon. I can tell you that story later. Uh, that's why we're money savvy families. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's uh, that was people asking me about the next iteration on financial independence. Uh, by the time uh, I was attending seminars and, and meetups in uh, say around 2016, 17, people said, yeah, yeah, I understand the 4% save withdrawal rate. I, I get it. I, I know how that works. I'm reaching financial independence. I'm cool. But my kids, man, uh, my kids. And so the questions became, how do we raise our children for financial independence? And it would start with, you know, I'm giving my children an allowance and they spend it in 10 minutes. Well, it turns out that's normal. Um, and so one night, uh, we, my wife and I were staying with our daughter and son-in-law at their apartment, just a family visit over the dinner table. And I said, you know, Carol, I got that question again at a, at a financial meetup about how to raise kids for financial independence. And I didn't really have an answer. I just kind of blurted out some stuff, but I really don't know. I, and and part of it is I don't really know what worked. Uh, what do you remember, Carol? What what worked and what didn't work? And, you know, we talk about t passing a torch, but that was more like dumping gasoline on a bonfire. And <laughs> and she had opinions. Most of them good. She had opinions. And so we start talking about it. And about 10 minutes in this conversation, I look over at my wife and she's making that sign that says, you know, you better be writing this down. And I did. And uh, that week, she was actually at the early stages of thinking about leaving active duty. She was uh, a Navy officer and she was on a surface ship and she was not happy with life and she was getting ready to get out. And so she had quite a few opinions on how to reach financial independence and why you would save and invest for financial independence. Uh, I, I got to admit, you know, I crowdsourced the military guide. I had 50 to 70 service members, military families, veterans, all helping me write that book. And I was able to keep up with those guys. I was able to write fast enough that we got the book published in a relatively timely manner. On Money Savvy Family, I was scrambling to keep up. I think she produced most of three chapters in two weeks. And at that point, I started writing some more stuff to tell my side of the story. And that's what we did. We talked about our brilliant parenting tactics, or, or what we thought were brilliant, versus how our daughter perceived those tactics when she was four years old or seven years old or 10 years old and what she really felt back then and then how she feels about it as an adult raising her own child. And so now she's got a new perspective on that as well. And we would do that contrasting back and forth in the chapters. And, and a lot of it was technology moving along. She would write half of a chapter 
and I would read it and I would send her some email about parts of the chapter that I was writing. And she basically said, well, that, that's cute, dad. Here's the link to the Google doc. Now let's write this online together. And we did. And again, I was scrambling to keep up. It turns out that she is a much faster, much better writer, perhaps than I am. Uh, and I'm good with editors and publishing. And so I had that side to bring to it. But the most important part was getting the kid's perspective on being motivated to manage your money, to learn how to save and invest your money and learn how to build a sustainable lifestyle out of it. And, you know, parents think they understand what their kids are telling them. And I'm living proof that we only had about half of it right. And that perspective that she gives as a kid and as an adult is very valuable in helping parents to figure out not only what are kids thinking, not so much, uh, and, and how to motivate them, how to give them the incentives. I mean, you and I, in a traditional corporate career, if somebody offered us $25,000 to do something a little differently with our work, we take that deal. And if we saved the employer some money in some project and they did profit sharing, he gave us $100,000 for saving the company money, we do that. And that's pretty much what you do with your kids to raise them with the financial incentives to reach their own FI. You give them financial incentives to save and invest. And again, there's going to be a lot of trial and error learning, mostly error. Uh, but in the long run, they eventually internalize it. Instead of channeling their mom and dad every time they think of something, they're going to internalize it for their own goals, their own work-life balance, their own lifestyle. And that's what we were writing about. That one is actually selling better as an audio book and as an ebook than in print. But that's oh, wow. uh, more uh, uh, that's more uh, an aspect of the publishing industry today, right? It's easier to listen to an audio book. Oh yeah. I love listening to audiobooks while I'm working out, yeah. going for a walk, yeah. driving in the car. Yeah. Like you just, it's like you can multitask. You can learn and that, do something that, else. Yeah. That driving in a car thing, that's when you're in there and your kids are a captive audience and they have to listen to what mom and dad are playing on the car audio. Uh, that's just a hint. That's just a suggestion. So what uh, you're saying the, is get the money savvy family, not the money smart family, money savvy family book yeah. and listen it, listen to it on a road trip with your kids. Um, and, and get it from the library and, and do yeah. that. And your you don't kids even have will to pay for it. You can get it from the library. But if you do pay for it, Doug's giving the proceeds to charity. So that's awesome too. Um, your, your kids will not listen to it. They will make fun of you. They will they will <laughs> mock you mercilessly, but that means that they care enough to listen. No, it's interesting. My kids love the topic of money. And so uh, Doug, it's really, it's been great having you on the show. Before we wrap up here, I just love that if there are any other tips you have for someone that's listening to this and maybe their eyes are open. They're like, maybe I can retire sooner than I thought. Um, what kind of tips do you have for them at that point? I'm I'm on a forum now that has a substantially high number of millionaires on the forum. And just like people who are saving for financial independence, these millionaires are earning a tremendous amount of money because they're good at what they do. And maybe they built up uh, investments of millions of dollars. Maybe their net worth is uh, five, 10, even there's one guy there, $50 million. They are still scared of running out of money they're still worried about leaving that $500,000 a year job behind and never being able to earn that much money ever again in their entire lives, which I can look back on that and say, maybe not, but maybe you don't need to earn $500,000 again for the rest of your life. And they're worried about all the things that could go wrong in the economy, the market, uh, you name it, they're worried about it. And it's because we're all humans. Uh, we're all worried about the emotions of behavioral financial psychology. And that is far more critical to amassing wealth and financial independence than just saving and investing. Your emotions will overcome that math and logic every time. You have to sleep comfortably at night. And so I talk with people about overcoming those fears of financial independence, so those fears of living off the 4% safe withdrawal rate. It's all on our website. It's all on a blog. You read it all there. And I'm going to write another book about building your life after financial independence. But if you're tempted by just one more year syndrome, if you say, I've reached the tripwire of the 4% safe withdrawal rate, but I'm going to keep working for just one more year and give myself a little margin, I would say to you that you're trading life energy that you might or you might not have for more money, which you definitely do not need. And if you don't get out of that habit of just one more year, and this time I really mean it, then you will have an opportunity cost measured in a lifespan that you did not use 
for your own purposes out of fear and out of a scarcity mentality. And so today I spend most of my time talking about that just one more year syndrome and breaking free of it to trust the 4% safe withdrawal rate. I love that. And so Doug, if if people want to stay in touch with you and keep up with your journey, where's the best place for them to find you? I'm I'm on Facebook groups for military personal finance. Uh, I'm also in a few other financial groups on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Twitter as the military guide. Uh, Also the blog is military financial independence. And here I'm going to hand out my email address on the internet. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years, so it's okay. Uh, it's Nords, Nords at gmail.com. Uh, you can find that anytime you look up Doug Nordman on the internet, you'll find my email address, Nords, Nords at gmail.com there. And just send me an email, ask me a question. I get them all the time and I'm happy to answer them because your story, if you choose, or your advice, if you want to, could hypothetically become part of a blog post or the next book for other people to benefit from your experiences and your wisdom at reaching financial independence. That's so awesome. Well, Doug, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, thanks, Deacon. I really enjoy being able to talk to your audience like this because 10% of them are veterans and 1% of them are on active duty. So I'm here to help.